Hello children, hope you are doing well. Today I am going to take up a lesson from NCERT's English textbook for class 12. The name of the textbook is Flamingo and the name of the lesson is Poets and Pancakes, Unit 6. In our previous session, we had talked about the first part of the lesson. The writer Ashok Mitran gave us a peek into the Gemini Studios. We visited the makeup department and we were told how makeup was done and people from different walks of life, different parts of the country were working over there and also he also told about people's aspirations and hopes. They all wanted to become actors or writers or directors but they could not become but they were part of the Gemini family. They were all working together. Let's begin with part 2. Now here the author is going to introduce us to Kothamangalam Subu. Let us understand who Kothamangalam Subu was in the Gemini studio at that time. Kothamangalam Subu rose to prominence in Gemini studios by sheer luck. He was number 2 over there after S.S. Vasan who was the founder of Gemini studio. Ashoka Mitran compares the two, the office boy and Subhu. Imagine Subhu at number 2 position and office boy, the person who used to run errands. Even in the matter of education, especially formal education, Subhu couldn't have had an appreciable lead over our boy. On the contrary, he must have had to face more uncertain and difficult times for when he began his career, there were no firmly established film producing companies or studios. Yet he had the ability to look cheerful at all times, even after having had a hand in a flop film. A beautiful comparison between the two, the boy, the office boy and Subu. Their positions were entirely different. Subu was at a higher position in Gemini studio and the office boy was not. He says their education was more or less the same. But Subu had one quality, he was very cheerful. But the office boy was always cribbing. Subu was also bossy and always had to work for somebody. He could never do things on his own. Here there are similarities. They were working for others. Even office boy was working for others. Subu was working for others, but he was giving them orders. Whereas the boy was receiving orders. But his sense of loyalty made him identify himself with his principal completely. Now principal here means the boss and turn his entire creativity to his principal's advantage. The author realizes that he was a savvy player, savvy. He was a smart player. He writes, Ashok Mitran writes, he was tailor made for films. Here was a man who could be inspired when commanded by describing an implausible scene being discussed in the studio, he highlights how far fetched the filmmaking was. So let's read these lines from the book. Open your books on page 60. You can read along. The rat fights the tigress underwater and kills her, but takes pity on the cubs and tends them lovingly. I don't know how to do the scene. The producer would say and Subo would come out with four ways of rat pouring affection on its victim's offspring. Good, but I am not sure it is effective enough, the producer would say. And in a minute, Subo would come out with 14 more alternatives. 
film making must have been and was so easy with a man like Subhu around. And if ever there was a man who gave direction and definition to Gemini Studios during its golden years, it was Subhu. So, we understand that Subhu was at the helm of affairs in Gemini Studios. Subhu had a separate identity as a poet and though he was certainly capable of more complex and higher forms, he deliberately chose to address his poetry to the masses. His success in films overshadowed and dwarfed his literary achievements or so his critics felt. He composed several truly original story poems in folk refrain and diction and he also wrote a sprawling novel Thilana Mohanambal with dozens of very DT-etched characters. He quite successfully recreated the mood and manner of the Dev Dasis of the early 20th century. He was an amazing actor. He never aspired to be the lead roles, but whatever subsidiary role he played in any of the films, he performed better than the supposed main players. He had a genuine love for anyone who came across and his house was a permanent residence for dozens of near and far relations and acquaintances. It seemed against Subhu's nature to be even conscious that he was feeding and supporting so many of them. Such a charitable and improvident man and yet he had enemies. You know such people always have enemies. The first position, he was number two in the Gemini studios. He was able to write script, he was able to write poetry, he was able to give alternatives to shoot the scenes. He was the man Friday. Okay? And then he was very helpful towards people. Many people would come and stay with him and he was feeding many people. But at the same time, he had many enemies and I think this is very natural. A person who does all these things has natural enemies. It, it is there even today. Okay, let us continue. Was it because he seemed too close and intimate with the boss? Yes, this is correct. He was number two. Or was it his general demeanor that resembled a psychophant's? His general demeanor was very friendly and he would appease everyone. Or his readiness to say nice things about everything. Yes, that was his nature. So he was a cheerful person. Therefore, he was liked by many. In any case, there was this man in the makeup department who would wish the direst things for Subhu. You saw Subhu always with the boss, but in the attendance roles, he was grouped under a department called the story department. So now we are going to read about the story department, comprising a lawyer and an assembly of writers and poets. But you know, there is this line over here. There was one person in the makeup department who did not like Subhu. Can you guess who this person is? The office boy, right? Let us come back to the story department. The lawyer was also officially known as the legal advice, advisor, but everybody referred to him as the opposite. The lawyer would also play pranks on the actresses. Some would even leave and never come back. There was a dress code for these poets and story writers. What was the dress code? While well, every other member of the department wore a kind of uniform, khadi dhoti, with a slightly oversized and clumsily tailored white khadi shirt, the legal advisor wore pants and a tie and sometimes a coat that looked like a coat of mail, coat of mail. This is one of the words which I had asked you to underline in the first session. Now, 
coat of mail means it is highly, de highly decorated. He would wear such things, but others would wear khadi. So that was the dress code for the story department because it comprised of writers, poets and this lawyer. Often he looked alone and helpless. Who? The lawyer, a man of cold logic in a crowd of dreamers. All other were dreamers, the story writers, the office boy, the actors, the poets, they were all dreamers. But this man was a man of logic, therefore he could not gel with them. He was a neutral man in an assembly of Gandhiites and Khadiites, like so many of those who were close to the boss. He was allowed to produce a film and though a lot of raw stock and pancake was used on it, not much came out of the film. So that means the film was not a good film. With this we have come to the, to the end of this particular part. Let us discuss a few questions now. Are you all ready? Hmm? My first question to you is, why was the office boy frustrated? Who did he show his anger on? Recollect what we discussed in the previous session. Yes, the office boy had joined the studio years ago in the hope of becoming an actor or a screenwriter or a director or a lyricist. The fact that he ended up becoming none of these left him frustrated. According to him, great literary talent was being allowed to go waste in a department fit only for barbers and perverts. He used to direct his anger at the author even though it was meant for Kothamangalam Subbu. They had nothing to do with each other. The office boy was from the makeup department and Subbu the story department. But the office boy did not like Subbu. Next question, who was Subbu's principal? The boss who was also the founder of Gemini Studios was Subbu's principal. Do you recollect the name? S.S. Vasan. Next question, Subbu is described as a many sided genius. List four of his special abilities. Subbu was a multidisciplinarian. Of course he was. He could provide solutions to problems, could remain cheerful all the time. He was an actor also, a poet and a novelist. These are the few things I have listed. You can add more to the list. You can go back to the text and add more to the list. Next question. Why was the legal advisor referred to as the opposite by others? A lawyer used to be a part of the story department at the Gemini Studios. Though a legal advisor was supposed to be involved in legal matters. His KG yet stupid idea led to the end of an actress's career. He played a prank on her. You can read the episode from the textbook and you will come to know how he really disturbed her and she never came back. Due to this, he was referred to as the opposite of a legal advisor by the people. Next question. What made the lawyer stand out from the others at Gemini Studios? The dress, the lawyer wore pants and a tie and sometimes a coat whereas everyone else in the story department wore similar khadi dhoti with a slightly oversized and clumsily tailored white khadi shirt. This was their dress code. Thus, the lawyer stood out from others at Gemini Studios as if he is a dispassionate man who did not take sides. Moreover, he was a logical man with no emotional attachment whatsoever. Let us continue with the story now. Then one day, 
the boss closed down the story department. Well, what's going to happen? And this was perhaps the only instance in all of human history where a lawyer lost his job because the poets were asked to go home. In fact, Gemini Studios was the favorite haunt of many accomplished poets like SDS Yogiyar, Sangu Subramanyam, Krishna Sastri, and Haridranath Chattopadhyay. You must have heard about these poets. Well, if you have not, this is the task for you. You can find about their profiles from the internet. This is a project work that I am giving you over here. You find out more about these poets online or from the library. And then you can share the information with your friends and also with your teacher. Let us continue. It had an excellent mess. Which mess? Chaos or canteen? Here it means canteen. Excellent mess which supplied good coffee at all times of the day and for most part of the night because the work used to go on 24 7. I think that is the case even today. Barring the office boys and a couple of clerks, everybody else at the studios radiated leisure, a prerequisite for poetry. Most of them wore khadi and worshipped Gandhiji. But beyond that, they had not the faintest appreciation for political thought of any kind. The author points out that the studio members were only interested in keeping up appearances. They had not bothered to analyze any political ideology or to adopt it. They were busy with their creative work as it has been referred to by the author Ashok Mitran. They were dreamers. They only dressed the part of Gandhians. So let us begin with another episode. Now Gemini studio was popular with foreign drama or theatre companies as well. So people had heard the name of Gemini studios overseas and they wanted to visit India and this was the place for theatre people or film industry to come and interact. When Frank Buckman's Moral Rearmament Army, some 200 strong, that means 200 people visited Madras. Now of course it is known as Chinnai, sometime in 1952. They could not have found a warmer host in India than the Gemini Studios. There were so many that they were jokingly compared to a circus, the MRA stage two place, Jotham Valley and the Forgotten Factor. They were a hit with the crowds. People really enjoyed. They ran several shows in Madras and along with the other citizens of the city. The Gemini family of 600 saw the place over and over again. The Gemini family of 600 so that means so many people were working over there, right? They were a hit with the crowds. The message of the plays were usually plain and simple homilies, but the sets and costumes were first rate. Madras and the Tamil drama community were terribly impressed and for some years almost all Tamil plays had a scene of sunrise and sunset in the manner of Jothamali with a large stage and a white background curtain and a tune played on the flute to indicate sunrise or sunset. It was only later that the author realized that MRA was also a propaganda wing and that the founder of Gemini Studios had absolutely no idea about their agenda. Mr. Vasans simply played into their hands. Now into their hands, if you remember, I had asked you to underline this phrase, into their hands. That means 
he had no idea what he did was in an innocent fashion. Ironically though, the politically disconnected staff of Gemini Studios had had a nice time hosting 200 people of all hues and sizes from at least 20 nationalities, but they enjoyed interacting with them. It was fun watching plays, looking after them. So there must have been a lot of hustle and bustle over there and it must have been a nice time for all of them. It was such a change from the usual collection of crowd players waiting to be slapped with thick layers of makeup by the office boy in the makeup department. You see the writer does not miss humor. He every now and then brings that you know how the office boy used to slap makeup on the crowd. The studio continued to receive guests from abroad. Okay. A few months later, Gemini Studios cleared a whole shooting stage to welcome another visitor. All they were told was that he was a poet from England. Now the moment they said a poet from England, they started thinking about Wordsworth, Tennyson, Shelley, Byron. The only poets from England the simple Gemini staff knew or heard of were Wordsworth and Tennyson. The more literate ones knew of Keats, Shelley and Byron and all these poets belong to the 19th century and this was happening in the 20th century. How could they come? One or two might have faintly come to know of someone by the name Eliot. On the whole, no one was up to date with contemporary English works. So, who was the poet visiting the Gemini studios now? So, that was the question. And then there was discussion, he is not a poet, he is an editor. That is why the boss is giving him a big reception. Vasan was also the editor of the popular Tamil weekly Ananda Viketan. He was not the editor of any of the known names of British publications in Madras that is those known at the Gemini studios. Since the top men of the Hindu were taking the initiative, the surmise was that the poet was the editor of a daily, but not from the Manchester Guardian or the London Times. The Hindu, the newspaper is popular even today. So, the newspaper was taking the initiative. That was all that even the most well informed among us knew. At last, around 4 in the afternoon, the poet or the editor arrived. He was a tall man, very English, very serious and of course, very unknown to all of us. Battling with half a dozen pedestal fans on the shooting stage, the boss read out a long speech. It was obvious that he too knew precious little about the poet or the editor. The speech was all in the most general terms about here and there. It was peppered with words like freedom and democracy. Then the poet spoke. You see what impression are we getting here? You see they were asked to host this poet. They were doing their bit. But the crowd actually did not know who he was. Let us continue. He could not have addressed a more dazed and silent audience. No one knew what he was talking about and his accent defeated any attempt to understand what he was saying. The whole thing lasted about an hour. Then the poet left and we all dispersed in utter bafflement, confused. What are we doing? What is an English poet doing in a film studio that makes Tamil films for the simplest sort of people? And what did he say? People whose lives least afforded them the possibility of cultivating a taste for English poetry. The poet looked pretty baffled too, for he too must have felt that, that there was no communication not even visual expressions were being exchanged. 
of any comprehension. His visit remained an unexplained mystery. So how beautifully the author has described with lot of humor, we can't help laughing, isn't it? So who was he? And he guesses Stephen Spender. Does that ring a bell in your mind? Do you remember his poem, The Elementary School Classroom in Islam? It's part of this course. You must have done this poem. The Elementary School Classroom in a Slum. Now this is your opportunity to go back and read the poem again. With this, we have come to the end of this session. I hope you enjoyed the session. Now, please read the text on your own. Divide it into chunks. Read at your own pace. Enjoy reading it. Well, if you come across any difficult word, try to gather the meaning from the context. Otherwise, refer to the dictionary. Enjoy reading. Thank you.